So today, we want to continue in this short little series that we're doing here in the month of July. It's called Night Hike, A Journey Through the Darkness. And we want to talk a little bit about rejection today. Have you ever felt rejected? I think all of us have at various points in our life. And rejection, I think, is probably one of the most common wounds that we all experience as we go through life. You know, though, our risk of feeling rejection used to be a little bit lower uh, due to the size of our social circles. You know, with the advent of electronic communication, social media platforms, and so forth, now rejection can be seen on stage throughout all of society. Now, if you have a Twitter account, you'll find that there's a lot of abusive things that go on on Twitter. And it seems as though Facebook is catching up to that, where what you used to uh, use simply to share pictures of your family or to wish somebody a happy birthday now can be a political point where people try to fight over social media. Well, sometimes what happens with that is there are people that not only criticize a position we might hold, but sometimes there's slander that comes along with that. And so we all, I think, at times have felt rejection. Sometimes that rejection might be self-imposed, self-inflicted because of our expectation that we place upon ourselves and so forth. So whether our rejections are large or small, one thing that remains constant through the whole thing is it ups our anxiety level. It kind of ups being depressed about our situation. And it can trigger this dark night of the soul if we're not careful. This dark night of the soul, which is simply a synonym for a night hike, uh, going through the dark on the trails where you can't see in front of you or what's coming next, can be a very disorienting thing. So as I mentioned earlier in the service about St. John of the Cross, St. John of the Cross for many months was in solitary confinement, and he was an individual that didn't know when he would get out. He was trying to do what he felt was best to bring people closer to Christ, and yet at the same time, there were those that were in positions of power that put him in a place where he did not have daylight, he did not have food, and he did not uh, uh, have the ability to cleanse himself. Now, this led to this Uh, ongoing dark night of the soul motif that all through Christian history, uh, this became kind of a metaphor of entering dark times. And what we find is that when we enter a dark time in our life, just like on a night hike, it sure would help if we could look to somebody who knew where they were going. So if any of you have ever taken a night hike, usually there's a guide up front that's able to say, okay, watch out for this step, watch out for that rock, watch out for this uh, route, that type of thing. It can be very thrilling if you live by faith in the guide that's leading you. So what we're doing this month is looking at four uh, night guides. Job, we looked at last week, Job was reprimanded by his friends uh, because he claimed innocence uh, about um, his life and his friends looked at all the suffering that he went through and basically reprimanded him because he was an individual that couldn't figure out why he was going through what he was going through. And yet, what we find is Job is resilient One friend after another criticizes him and reprimands him and calls him to confess what he did wrong. By the end of the book, though, the only one that was reprimanded by God was the three friends, not Job. Job spoke honestly about his feelings and what he was going through. So today we're going to look at Jeremiah, and it's a long book, so I'm only going to pull a couple of threads out. But if you read this book, one of the things that you're going to find is you can see why he had been nicknamed the weeping prophet. So I read for you just a couple of sections where he was thrown into a cistern. Another time he was uh, put in stocks and bonds. He was 
arrested multiple times by his religious order, if you will. And he was an individual, though, that was resilient up to a breaking point. In Jeremiah chapter 20, what we'll see is that he wants to resign. Have you ever felt like that? You've tried to serve Christ your whole life. Things have fallen apart. People are critical of you. They ultimately might reject you uh, for a position that you might hold or an outlook that you might have. And Jeremiah comes to a point where he wants to say, okay, I have had enough. Now, in order to understand what he went through, we got to go back to the beginning just for a second. So Job, the reprimanded, has resiliency, but Jeremiah, the rejected, has courage because he keeps speaking the truth. Now, this is small print for you, but if you looked at the book of Jeremiah, in chapters 1 through 23, he has poems of accusation. Then in chapters 25 through 30, uh, 29, he has prophecies against specifically his own people, the people of Judah, and he tells them that there's a foreign power that's going to come and take them into captivity, but they're not without hope. In chapters 30 through 33, he promises that if they will stay faithful to God, God will bring them back from exile to their homeland. Chapters 34 through 44 talk about the pain that the people are going through while they're in exile. And then finally, in chapters 45 through 52, he turns his attention to the other nations that bring pain upon his people. So <clears throat> I'm going to post this uh, uh, slide online if you want to take a look at it uh, on our website and stuff. I'll, I'll post it between, uh, beneath... Uh, uh, the video that we're recording, so you can, you can see it if you'd like to take a look at it. But Jeremiah has been called since the day he was a young man. In chapter 1, we're told that he lived over the course of the reigns of three kings of Judah, and they are named in verses 1 through 4, uh, Josiah, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. And then it says, the word of the Lord came to me, and this is what God said to Jeremiah, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So he comes to Jeremiah and says, I need you to be the mouthpiece. I need you to speak up. I need you to say, thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah objects, so he says, oh Lord, Look, I don't know how to speak since I'm only a youth. And this is the promise that God gave to him in verse 7. Do not say I, I am only a youth, for you will go to everyone I send you to and speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anyone, for I am with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. So he is called at a very young age. It is believed that he had ministered to a people that had gone astray from God for over 40 years. And what we find is no one would listen to him. And so he, he is ministering in this turbulent time of military and political unrest. And there are three main powers that are all vying for control of the land of Israel, Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon. And the kings always were switching allegiances depending upon who they thought they had the best chance to be on the winning side, okay? So Zedekiah and Jehoiakim and Josiah are all these kings that are trying to protect the people. Now, Josiah was a good king. He, he was an individual that was trying to make some of the same reforms Jeremiah was doing, but he was killed in battle, and he was replaced by Jehoiakim and then Zedekiah. And what we find is this whole territory that's known as the Fertile Crescent is in the middle of battle. Assyria, you remember the story of Jonah, was at one time in 650 B.C. the dominant power, but... 
Then Babylon comes to power and overpowers Assyria. In 627, uh, they revolt against the Assyrian Empire. And then Egypt comes up from the south and is trying to take hold of that area. And it is in 605, they are defeated at a battle of Carchemish, which is up near the north there. So you see all of these changes are taking place. And by 597 B.C., the Babylonians march to the south, they capture Judah, and they will eventually burn the temple to the ground. They defeat Egypt as well, and they are the dominant player in the Old Testament. You read the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, have you heard of him? He is the one that's in power of the Babylonian Empire at this time. So here's Jeremiah. He's been told by God to say, turn, repent, thus saith the Lord. So what happens in chapter 7 of Jeremiah is a summary of his message. And the summary is basically centered on a couple of things. The injustice, the injustice that's going on in the temple area. Just listen to this. It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah the Lord, stand in the gate of the house of the Lord and there call out this word. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who enter through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, correct your ways and your actions and I will allow you to live in this place. Do not trust deceitful words chanting, this is the temple of the Lord, this is the temple of the Lord, this is the temple of the Lord. A side note on that. They're trying to hide behind religious language. We're safe. We're not going to be conquered. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. It's sort of the same thing that we would experience when people say, no one's going to defeat the United States. We have right on our money, in God we trust, in God we trust, in God we trust. But their trust was in the false things. Because it goes on and it says this, Do not trust deceitful words chanting, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Instead, if you really correct your ways and your actions, if you act justly toward one another, if you no longer oppress the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow, and no longer shed innocent blood in this place or follow other gods, bringing harm on yourselves, I will allow you to live in this place, the land I gave to your ancestors long ago and forever. You know, the Christian church has been using religious language to hide their misdeeds for centuries. Things like injustice and racism, things like hatred toward the LGBTQ community, things that are happening around us all the time, and it is still covered with religious language. And they even say, well, if if we can't have our own religious convictions, we're the ones that are being persecuted, even though they are not the ones that are suffering at the hands of unjust policies. And so Jeremiah would say the same thing to our nation as he said to his. And that is, quit hiding behind religious language. Do what is right. Do what is just. Do what is loving. Do what is compassionate. Do that which helps mankind, not hurts mankind. Are you following what I'm saying? And that is the message that Jeremiah carries out over the course of his life and then what happens is he's rejected. Multiple times, I mean multiple times, throughout the book, he's been rejected over and over and over again. But I want you to hear his response in chapter 20. In chapter 20, after he has once again been rejected by the leadership and his own people that he is trying to help, he turns to God And I think all of us have felt this way at times. God has prompted us or called us to do something and it didn't turn out the way we wanted it to turn out. And it just seems like the bottom falls out. And we look back to God and we go, what? You were the one that kind of put me onto this trail, right? This dark 
trail, this night hike that I'm on. So Jeremiah then looks and he says to God, listen, you deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You seized me and prevailed. In other words, you put this calling on my life, and I am a laughing stock all the time. Everyone ridicules me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I proclaim violence and destruction, so the word of the Lord has become my constant disgrace and derision. I say, I won't mention him or speak his name any longer. So what Jeremiah says is, I quit. Here's my resignation, God. I'm done being a prophet. I'm not going to speak your words anymore. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm going to hide. And I'm going to be safe. And then he says this. I won't mention him or speak any longer in his name. But, there's a big but. His message becomes a fire burning in my heart. Shut up in my bones. I become tired of holding it in. I cannot prevail. You know what he's saying? But I see what's going on around. I see the mistreatment of other people, and I can't hold it in any longer. I've got to speak out. I've got to let people know this is not right. I think he knows more rejection's coming. And yet, he has the courage to say, Thus saith the Lord, this is not right, what is being done to these people. So as he is rejected, and he comes to this melting point where he is emotionally and physically spent, after he's been arrested numerous times, here's what happens. God comes to him, and he says, here's the message I want you to give the people. And this is the most famous passage in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. So, God tells Jeremiah, I want you to write this down, because this is a promise I'm making to my people, if they will listen. And it says here, in 29 verse 4, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For when it thrives, you will thrive. And this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you, and don't listen to the dreams you elicit from them, for they are prophesying falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. And this is where, this is the verse that's probably on a number of greeting cards that you have bought, okay? For this is what the Lord says, when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and I will uh, confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. Here it is. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for your disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And you will call to me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. Now, there's a a couple of things to to sort out here. You have it on a magnet. You have it on a greeting card. And I understand that's a promise all of us want to cling to. But the first application of that promise is Jeremiah is holding out hope to the remnant that's willing to hold on to God. Even though they have been in captivity for almost 70 years, he says, I'm going to bring you out of captivity. I'm going to bring you home. Well, what am I to do in the meantime, they might ask Jeremiah. Did you hear the beginning of it? Build houses, get married, have a family, work a job, try to uh, be a benefit to the city that you're living in. Wherever we are, 
on our night hike. We know that we're not without hope because God is still with us even when we can't see Him. But these night guides like Job and Jeremiah, they're telling us, keep taking the next step forward. Keep taking the next step forward because as you do, God will open up the horizon to you. God will bring the sun up at the end of the trail. Keep taking the right steps. Don't fall for all of this that you hear around you. You stay true. Keep your eyes on God. Take the next step forward. Be resilient like Job. Be courageous like Jeremiah. Just keep moving forward. I know the plans that I have for you. The problem is it's hard to believe that when we're in a cistern of silence, right? When we can't hear from God. But at the same time, in the dark night of the soul, what we have are these promises that we can hang on to because God will never leave us nor forsake us. So, my brothers and sisters, we live in a turbulent time. Seems like all hell is broke loose in our culture. Seems like everything's fallen apart at the seams. It seems like religious people are at the forefront of a lot of the abuse and injustice that's taking place. What am I to do? What are you to do? Keep trusting that God's in control. Keep taking the next step forward. Keep looking to individuals like Job and Jeremiah and realize that in the end, God was leading through that dark night. God is leading on that night hike. And as we continue to do what's right, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Focus on that. Do what's right. Love mercy. Be compassionate. And continue to be humble. And if we can do those things, my brothers and sisters, if we can seek the welfare of people around us, this becomes a prophecy of hope for us, too. That God is not off the throne. He sees misdeeds that are going on. He sees injustice. And so we who see Him through that slight sliver of daylight that comes while we're in the cistern, we can understand that the dark night is the worst. Yes, it's not fun going through it. However, it eventually reveals the best. And what we find is as Jeremiah is lifted up out of the cistern, as St. John of the Cross is released from that monastery prison, here we are, all these centuries later, still talking about St. John, and Teresa of Avila, and Jeremiah the prophet. And their story continues to resonate to you and me who live here in 2022. And it continues to motivate us to get our eyes off ourself and not sit in and wallow in our self-pity, but to be ambassadors of love and mercy and grace and if everybody else is trying to get their way or get ahead by taking advantage of other people, don't you dare do it. You do what's right. Love people with your whole heart. Serve them with your entire spirit. Let's conquer these stupid things that we've been battling forever. The things of injustice and racism and hatred and all these things that are going on. There have been those night guides that are not in the Bible, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that have led us ahead in some of these things to allow us to see that God works sometimes a step at a time for it to break open. And that's what we pray for. Take it a step at a time and allow God to do His work. And when we do, we will certainly look back and say, God, you were in control of this situation even when I thought you weren't. You were with us even when I thought you weren't. So would you join me in prayer as we close this message, and I'm going to have the team come back up, and we're going to do a last song here called Lead Me and Guide Me. But I want to pray, and I want us to understand that we all need these type of night guides when we're going through the dark nights. And so would you stand with me, please, as we pray? 
Heavenly Father, we all have our own night hike. We, have, we all have our own troubles. We all have our own things that we have to work through, and we have those walls around us that seem to imprison us at times. And we're praying, Father, that we might not give up, but we might feel the fire that's still inside our bones like Jeremiah did. We pray, Lord, that even when we want to resign, even when we want to throw it away and give up, that you're still, by your Spirit, working inside of us to help us to take the next step, whatever that might be. Lord, give us courage like Jeremiah. Give us resiliency like Job. And help us to be a beneficial presence in our world around us. Lord, indeed, like I said at the beginning of the service here, the life is a gift. Help us to cherish it. And love is the point. Help us to mature in it and help us to be a beneficial presence in this world. Lord God, we depend upon you to help us to do this. In Jesus' name, amen.